All right, hello everyone and welcome to the after show for the Lindors Abbey Rapid Challenge. We had the, what was it, the fourth day of quarterfinal action today. Uh, and so we saw the match continue between Wesley So and Magnus Carlsen and between Sergei Karyakin and Daniel Dubov. We had a must-win situation for Karyakin and a must-win situation for Wesley So. One of them got it done, the other one did not manage. Uh, and so with that, I will show you um, I will show you the standings here and the results of today. Um, so as you can see here, Magnus Carlsen with an impressive score, two and a half to half again. Um, although I think the score is not representative of the games here. The games were really hard fought. Um, you can't see it on this screen, but these wins were actually with the black pieces for Magnus Carlsen. Um, and the one draw with White, they did not play the fourth game because the, the result of the match was already uh, decided. Um, and in the other match, we had Daniel Dubov against Karyakin in a um, kind of crazy match. Uh, Karyakin won the first game and lost two games in a row, uh, putting you know Dubov very close to winning this match. And then Karyakin won with Black the very last game in a... Um, you know, sort of a surprising fashion. We'll look at that. And then Karyakin wins the Armageddon, forces uh, forth, forces this match to go to uh, a third and final match or set, as you like to call it. Um, I will show you here. As you can see, the first semifinal is, is set. Uh, Hikaru Nakamura will play Magnus Carlsen. Uh, it is in a couple of days because we have, uh, we have of course, the... Other, the other uh, side of the bracket, the bottom half of the bracket, has to play tomorrow. Um, and then I do believe there is a free day after that. So the, the first semifinal will be played in a few days on May 28th, uh, May the 28th. And um, yeah, I guess there, there's only one that, that comes after then. Um, but... Um, but of course, tomorrow uh, tomorrow will be the action in the other two uh, the other two quarterfinals to decide who gets to move on, and the two winners from tomorrow will face each other. Um, but today was uh, today was a surprising day, I think. Uh, let, let's go through the chess. I'm actually going to start today. We we always start with Magnus Carlsen. He is obviously um, you know the, the the guy who gets the most attention all the time on Chess 24, but also everywhere. Today, you know, let's change it up. Let's start with Dubov Karyakin. Uh, there was definitely a game that was amazing there with, with an idea that I think was really original that I want to show you guys. Um, I do want to speak a little bit also. Uh, this was uh, the day for uh, Sergei Karyakin. We published an article by and Andrei uh, Terechov uh, here who um, writes about Karyakin, who was a prodigy. He was the, I believe, the youngest, uh, the youngest grandmaster at the age of 12 years and seven months, as it says in the article here. Um, uh, but the article talks about his background as a chess player, the places where he's lived. You know, he played for the Ukraine. Uh, the the younger players here may not be aware, but he played for the Ukraine for many years before uh, now uh, switching to the Russian team. Um, the year where when he was born was a very prolific year for chess with, uh, you know, born the same year as Magnus, uh, as Jan Nepomneshi, Max MVL. Uh, and David Howell, they're all from the same uh, birth year, which is a, a funny coincidence. Um, and yeah, so I, I, you know, I encourage you to write, to, to read through the article. Uh, Karyakin really was uh, extremely strong from the youngest age, gave Magnus a really tough world championship match. This is all written about here. Um, check it out on Chess24. All right, so moving on to the chess, which is always the... Uh, most fun part of the day. Uh, what did I do here? My games are not loading. Give me one second. We're having a slight Pascal tech glitch here. It happens. It happens to me sometimes. Hopefully I can actually find my notes though, which otherwise we are in big trouble. No, I have them. I have them right here. Just give me about. Here we go. We have found the games. All right. So we have liftoff. Um, I'm just resetting the moves here. This always loads with uh, with the final position instead of the uh, beginning position. 
And by the way, I am always reading the Chess24 chat and try to respond to questions, so always feel free to ask. Um, I certainly think it's good to make this as interactive as possible. A uh, couple of comments. A couple of comments. Um, a couple of comments before we start today. You will notice that the the opening choices of Daniel Dubov are really, especially with Black, are really fascinating all the time. And so it, it is a it is a treat to have him in this tournament because we get to look at some some funky stuff. So today he plays Knight C6 on move one, uh, and on D4 D5. So we've seen him do this before. It's um it's a surprising weapon. It's not. It, I will say it is not as easy as you would think to get an advantage for White. Uh, most of the top players seem to play e5 here, um, and so you get a position that is, you know, reminiscent of the Karakhan. In the Karakhan, of course, you'd have the pawn on c6, that's the first move black plays, and their knight back on b8, uh, which in a way is more fluid because it, it lets you play c5 more easily. On the other hand, the knight, you know, immediately puts pressure on d4, and black usually plays, you know, with f6 in this, and uh, that's the way they try to kind of break open the center. Um, Karyakin plays in plays in sort of the uh, the prescribed uh, way here with c3, which has been played by many players, including Anand and, and others. Uh, but frankly, you know, it doesn't feel to me like he gets much in this uh, in this game. And maybe he, you know, he had looked at this a little bit and just decided to uh, to play it more or less safe and thought that he had a chance to get a small advantage. Uh, but I don't feel like this is really a test of, of Black's play. So we'll have to see if Dubov continues to repeat this variation. I think it's something that he's going to play like infrequently, not, not something that he's going to play every game. Uh, but if he keeps playing this variation, I'm curious to see if White finds sort of more ambitious ways. Because here, uh, this position, maybe White is a touch better. And I, I do wonder if maybe he could try to play Knight h6 first. Uh, to avoid what happens in the game here. And on EF, you can just play GF. That position looks okay for, for black. Um, so I'm curious if knight h6 first could be maybe a little bit more precise. But in the game, he plays FE, FE, knight h6, which uh, lets white take on h6. And white gets this position. And I can't say king d7. It's a bit of an odd move, but in this variation, you actually do this quite a bit because... Uh, he wants the queen to come this way. Of course, after g8, he doesn't really want to put the king on g8. Um, so it makes sense. And he's going to play queen g8, rook f8. The position is actually fairly solid for black. I don't think black can be unhappy with the opening outcome here. And sure enough, he plays queen g8, castles, queen g6. And white doesn't really have anything much better than to go for this ending. Um, and... I think that black should be able to hold this. It's a little bit easier for white to play. And the funny thing is that if you look at the, the game that they get in the next game, uh, which Dubov wins, it's sort of a, they reach a somewhat similar end game in the sense that white has a little bit more space, uh, a little more space, but uh, no, no real weakness for black. The knights are probably a little better than the bishop. The bishop doesn't have incredible prospects in this position. Um, so then they play a long sort of waiting game. I, I will. Uh, I pinpointed a few moments to to talk to you guys here. H5 was an interesting decision. Uh, the computer, if you look at the the computer's uh, suggestions, the computer likes to play uh, G5. It's a tough move for a human to play, and the computer says this is equal. You know, a human and computer is probably right. It's hard to disagree with the computer these days. But uh, for for from a human perspective, it's hard to put these pawns on the dark squares. Uh, you know, you can sort of foresee a position where this knight might end up on h5, you know, through f1, g3, h5. Um, and it's not so it's not so clear. Um, that said, the computer feels that that black gets counterplay. The, the, it likes to play with like knight d8. I tried to make some move c5, you know, maybe sometimes bring the knight back. But maybe that was better because in a game he does end up, he plays h5 and he does end up suffering a little bit. Uh, white gets their pawn to g4, which makes a lot of sense, stopping the knight from coming to f5. And now with his bishop on this side, he doesn't really get to play the, the c5 break, and it becomes passive. At some point, you know, you have to consider white potentially playing b4, and even if it's not always good, just the fact that that's out there with the idea of creating either a weakness on c5 by taking on a5, or creating a pass pawn after this, you know, play a5. Either of these positions... Um, these, just that that's a possibility is something that can really nag you, nag your brain. And so it becomes difficult. 
Uh, and so here, um, Dubov decides to let White uh, trade the knight for the bishop. But after this, it gets a little bit it gets a little bit difficult for him to play. Um, knight g5, and so here it's a uh, you know it's just the the issue of whether whether that all that extra space will be able to will be enough to win or not. Uh, rook f1 was probably a mistake here, and maybe the decisive one. Uh, it looks like rook f8 would have uh, been a better chance to hold um, by sort of keeping keeping. Um, Keeping some control of the f file, or at least fighting for it. Uh, I'm sure Dubov did not like this with the knight coming to h7, uh, but here he he has a little trick, which I'm sure is easy to miss in a in a in a, uh, in a game with this time control. But because of this move h4 with the idea of rook h8, he actually holds. So he plays rook f1, and now um, the position is really tough. C5, the only chance for counterplay, even though it does uh, sacrifice a pawn. Um, he plays here. Now, white, I think, makes a mistake. Um, there was a very nice move here, rook f6. And with that move, white probably has a decisive advantage. The idea is that if we take, now this f pawn is actually very strong. Um, while in the game, he trades rooks. And um, that's a safer, it's a safer move. But here, black gets extremely close to getting a fortress. And I mean, actually does get uh, a fortress more or less. Uh, it just remains tricky and hard to hard to defend for black in a practical game. Uh, but here, um, yeah, and here uh, Daniel uh, cracked under the pressure. Uh, but if he played knight to e8, uh, knight f5, king b6, it doesn't look like white has a way to make progress here. Um, so in knight e3, we just go back and eventually, uh, eventually we're able to to come and take this pawn. Uh, and if, or like this rather, and if white plays knight to f5, sorry about this arrow, then the pawn on g4 will, will fall. So he still had a chance to hold, uh, but he played king d6, and now because knight f5 comes with check, and then king c5, now he doesn't have a good way to 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 prevent, well, the king is already, can't say prevent the king from entering, because the king has already entered, of course, uh, but now it's completely lost. So just sort of a The rest, the rest was uh, was just technical. Karyakin, a, a very strong uh, technical player. Staying hydrated here. It is a very hot day in Florida, by the way. Um, so first game, you know, big win for Karyakin. The next game, I'm not going to go in much detail because it was honestly a little bit of a boring game, and I'd rather focus on the all the excitement we had today. Um, I'll just show you that Dubov played this move e3, which had never been played, and I think that was preparation. And he gets sort of a, a maybe barely better position for white. Uh, I would call it a massaging position where you, you really don't have anything, but you can kind of keep making moves and hope hope that the space advantage amounts to something if, if only to make your opponent make a mistake. Um, but just going very quickly here, obviously, because uh, there was a lot of shuffling around here. Um, until here, he finally gets uh, a better position. Daniel does, uh, and you know, so Black could have improved earlier. And then the rest of the game is really just a, a long technical grind. I mean, it, but it, he played this this very well actually. Um, this plan with B four was very strong. Um, and already, this this position is very difficult. These three three pawns are all weak, and the knight does a, a very good job of uh, of switching back and forth. Um, so I, I don't think I, Sergei had really a, a good way to hold this position. He could have held earlier probably, uh, but here was already basically lost. Um, so, but this takes us to the third game. And the third game was really exciting uh, and looked like that was going to tip the, you know, tip the match in favor of Dubov, which would have been uh, would have been of course the end the end of the road for Karyakin here. Um, so, um, what does Dubov do on the first move? D5. I think that was even in our fantasy contest. Is there going to be a Scandinavian in this tournament? And the answer comes from Daniel Dubov that yes, there will. Um, and he plays the variation with Queen D6, which is um, which is one that Magnus has played a lot, especially in Blitz. Um, Certainly a, a pretty bold choice because Karyakin is known to be incredibly well prepared 
And, you know, I'm sure that in all the time that he's done uh, work, you know, preparing for Magnus, he's looked at this before. So, so a bold choice. And knight c6, which is a provocative move. Again, I think Magnus has played this in some banter blitzes. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a provocative one. But And Karyakin uh, plays knight b5, which is the most ambitious move. Uh, you know, I do wonder if, if, if after this game, players will reconsider playing this variation for black because it, it did lead to a very nice game for black. Uh, Queen d8, bishop f4, so it's the most ambitious plan. We force black to play knight d5, bishop g3, and now the threat is c4. But uh, black is just in time, plays a6. And now I think uh, the move that Karyakin played probably will not be repeated. Uh, you can see why he played it, but I think that uh, knight c3 will probably be uh, be a move that people try, you know, if this position uh, is seen again. Because knight a3, surprisingly, you know, white, white plays knight a3 because he wants to play c4, kick that knight away and get, you know, potentially a, a nice position. But here Dubov plays a great move, e5, so a, sort of a clearing... Uh, clearing pawn sacrifice. The the main idea is to play bishop b4 check, uh, but also of course in the air is to take that knight on a3 and double the pawns. Um, not too many options for white here. Uh, he you know he took he took on e5 with the d pawn. Uh, if he plays knight takes e5, then bishop b4 is just really really strong with c3. Knight takes c3. Um, so that's that's pretty that one is pretty clear, right? This position gets to be. Uh, very ugly, right? So, um, so he doesn't want to take with the knight because that knight is defending the d4 pawn, right? We'll see why that's relevant. Uh, I guess you know. Lastly, taking with the bishop, bishop b4 is also is also a bad one. Knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. Whenever you're forced to play um, to play king e2, it's you know things are not things are not going well. Uh, and here, black has a few different ways. To, to play, but maybe even f6. I mean, there's different uh, different ideas that would be clearly looks wrong for white. So he takes with the, the d pawn. Uh, now bishop b4 check. And white makes, I think, a, a big mistake, although it's one that's almost imperceptible. And I do wonder whether Dubov had prepared the what comes next. But white plays a very natural knight d2. Um, c3, um, and it's hard to know if it was preparation because Dubov did take about a minute to play e5, you know, out of the 15 minutes. So that's pretty quick for a move that's hard to calculate. But it's also not like if you played it instantly, then you would know for sure that it's preparation. Um, but yeah, so c3, knight takes c3. That would have been just a mayhem on the board. Uh, there's a lot of lines here. I looked at this, you know, where you can either take here or you could just play the end game. The end game looks fine for black, so that's certainly not a, a test of the viability of the black position, but it's at least maybe safer than one. Well, the game just turned out to be bad. Um, but uh, yeah, so c3, knight takes c3. White can also try taking on d8. And then uh, surprisingly, the best move is king takes d8. And this is, this is pretty amazing too. If you play knight d8, um, then white has this move, knight c2. And on knight takes a2, king d1. The knight is attacked and the bishop is behind. So that's why taking on d8 with the king is actually better because that knight covers the bishop. So if we do the same thing here and play knight c2, knight a2, king d1, well now the bishop is covered. So we can just play bishop e6, defend the knight, and there's no rook takes a2 like this because the knight covers it. So there's all these weird, crazy tactical subtleties in this position. But going back to the game, um, Dubov... Uh, Sorry, uh, Karyakin plays knight to d2. And this move here, I really think is the move of the day. In fact, you may see it in our highlight on our light, highlight reel, um, which we publish every day. But um, h5, an unbelievable move. And the thing, the thing with this, and this is why I thought maybe this was preparation, because I feel like to find this idea over the board, if Dubov found this, I mean, I tip my, tip my hat, because this is really an amazing move. Um, so of course the, the, the immediate threat is to play h4, uh, but the very deep point is what's the difference, right? What's the difference if you play h3, um, of this position versus, uh, versus playing knight d4 right away. So knight d4 is, is sort of in the air in this position, uh, with the idea 
that you can play bishop f5 and take on a3, right? So this is this is clearly in the air. But what's the point of playing first, sorry, after knight d2, playing first h5? So the point is if we play h3, knight to d4, um, the sensible move here to to try to uh, to get the knight in the game is to play knight to c4, bishop f5. So we're threatening this. Now bishop d3 is never really a move that you want to make because after this simple capture, the knight is a monster here and black has a, a very, very nice position, better for black already. Can play like h4, queen g5. Um, you know, this position is good for black. Um, so rook c1, for example, and now look at this crazy idea, bishop c3. And when I saw this, I I was uh, I was befuddled. I was really in amazement. The idea is that in all these lines, the queen is trapped. And it's trapped because it can't go to h5 because the rook protects it. And this is just, this is, this is just crazy. It's really crazy. Um, and in fact, you know, more than that, the threat is to simply take on b2 and then play knight. Sorry, my arrow here, knight to c3. And it is really beautiful. Um, someone in the chat is asking if this is theory. And um, I don't think it's real theory. I mean, it's never really been played. So uh, a lot of this is is new. Uh, but it may there may have been some blitz games. You know, this this uh, line has been played a lot in blitz by some very strong players. So I'm, I'm not too sure. But uh, I don't think this position itself, it might have been, you know, homework by Dubov. I, I really can't tell. But this h5 has these incredibly deep ideas that are really beautiful. Karyakin plays h4, very natural. Uh, but I, I, this does allow bishop to g4. And now the position just kind of collapses for white. Bishop e2. Uh, there's not really anything that makes sense here. If you play like queen c1, um, then this is already very strong. Black is well developed and black and white can't really castle. Bishop e5, queen e7. Uh, and this is just, uh, you know, white doesn't get to develop. Knight c4, b5, you're threatening to take. And then this is still falling. f4, there's always knight f4. Um, so anyway, this is this is, uh, this is is not very good for, for for white, which is why he plays bishop e2. But now after bishop a takes a3, he's already losing a piece. And with that, the game. Um, so... Yeah, here um, everything is falling apart. Again, this knight c3 is in the air. The rook is uh, under attack. And so the rest of the game is sort of uh, just a matter of consolidating, not blundering. Uh, black is up uh, a rook for a pawn. Um, so it doesn't last very long. Just a matter of not, not hanging a piece. Um, yeah, so white resigned because here after rook f2, there's rook d1 check, uh, picking up everything. So Dubov uh, now leading two to one, uh, going into the last game where he's got the white pieces, a uh, very invi inv viable situation. Um, and uh, Sergei repeats his opening. That is like his, uh, I guess that's his go-to uh, opening for when you need to win with black, you know, without taking incredible risk. Um, and he did manage to, uh, to get a good position in the last uh, last time, and um, here Dubov goes for this h3 plan, uh, which is in the other game. Well, in the other game, actually, Sergei had played bishop back to c8, so now he plays with bishop g4. Um, and White does have a you know what seems to be a very safe position here, and he should be able to uh, to hang on you know without too many problems. Uh, but again, you know, it seems like maybe Dubov playing for a draw is not his favorite thing to do. Um, I'm not a big fan of playing with D takes E5 here. I think, you know, D5 is still, uh, is still very much, uh, possible. And, you know, white has probably a, a preferable, a preferable position here, uh, after say knight C5, just bishop C2. Um, I think he played a little bit too safe here and ended up, uh, ended up with a, you know, not as great a position as he would otherwise have. I mean, d takes e5 is okay. Pawn takes queen e2. So, you know, we're going to fast forward here a little bit. Um, knight e4 was another move that I didn't like. I think, you know, in these positions with white, you play b4 and you try to play c5 to get your bishop to a nice diagonal here on c4. Um, 
And it seems to work out uh, fairly well for white in this case. Um, you know, for example, something like this is, is possible and white is not gonna be worse almost ever in positions like this. Um, you know, the light squared bishop is kind of missed uh, in the black position. So, um, but you know, Daniel, nothing really wrong with what he did. He just, you know, did not play very ambitiously. Again, here, bishop a3, not very ambitious. Uh, potentially a3, once again, you know, letting this happen, take, take, and then at some point uh, preparing to play b4. Maybe even, I don't know if you can even play b4 here. I think you could. Um, I think, you know, these kinds of plans, I'm not saying white is better here. White's, black's probably hanging on just fine. But that seems like uh, white should not really get into any kind of trouble here. He plays bishop a3, and again, his position is okay, but... Here, uh, in the opposite colored bishop, position black is going to try to, I'm going to use the word massage again, this position. They're going to try to just play forever. And uh, and if anything, black is better just because the the the, uh, the weakness of the white king and the, the slightly better bishop that they have. So the pawn on e4, you know, gives them more space. So um, the rest of the game is not not especially interesting because not, not too much happens here. But... Um, Black is just shuffling, sort of waiting to see if, if white will make a mistake. And sure enough, in this position, um, white, you know, has been shuffling, making these kinds of moves. Could have played king g2 and eventually, um, I mean, black would play forever, right? Because they have to try. But this would be an equal position. Uh, but white finally cracks, plays rook d7, allowing a pseudo-sacrifice. Of course, very obvious to both of these guys. It's just a question of, uh, you know... Um, in time pressure, sometimes you just make a move too fast. And here black is finally completely in the driver's seat. Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, there's more or less forced, uh, forced checkmate on the board here, wins a rook. So, um, so th this takes us to Armageddon. And in Armageddon, um, white was well in control. And I'll just show these Armageddon games, you know, are uh, of course, not the highest quality because of the time control with no increment. Um, but Dubov was completely in control. And he, so he's going to be kicking himself for this match because he gets this position with the white pieces uh, and has essentially mate in a few moves here by playing queen f2, which is probably the most obvious move in the position uh, with the move queen g3 coming next. And there's really no defense here. Um, this is just forced mate, you know, with queen h6 and, and very, very standard uh, kind of uh, kind of few moves. And on g6, then again, it's very standard queen g3 with the idea of queen g5, queen h6. Uh, black doesn't have a defense. King h7 doesn't help because we'll have queen takes h5 <clears throat> with that pin. So um, so yeah, this is just this is just made in a few moves. So um, instead, you know, Duboff plays knight h4. And I think he was just, you know, being fancy, basically. He, you know, he's a bit of an artist, plays knight f5, and then suddenly the position is not clear after rook e8. Um, the exchange sacrifice leads to, I mean, it's probably still better for white, but not, it's not checkmate anymore. And, um, and yeah, now things just, you know, he just lost the thread of the position. And even though he was still doing fine here, um, black got counter chances and eventually uh, one here, he should have tried to simplify things with rook b7, and uh, but they had no time already, and so uh, black managed to turn things around and, and win this game. So a huge, uh, huge turnaround for for Karyakin here, who was uh, sort of looked like he had four, you know, the seven different lives you can call in this match. Uh, managed to win with black, a position that was very close to a draw. And uh, and one with black, the Armageddon game from a position that was completely lost. So really, uh, uh, Dubov has to recover. You know, he's been the dominant player in this match. And uh, hopefully he'll come back with some inspired chess tomorrow. Um, so now let's look at the Magnus Carlsen match. Uh, it started with Magnus having the black pieces. He plays the Berlin, which he has played, uh, you know, quite a bit recently. D3, Bishop C5. We've seen a lot of games with this. Hikaru has also played this with black. Uh, a lot of the games recently have been with Bishop takes C6. Wesley here plays C3. Um, the opening itself was not 
not necessarily a huge success for white, but it certainly was was not unreasonable either. Like this, they get a position here. This looks like a Rai Lopez sort of uh, typical uh, Rai Lopez type structure um, with the bishop on c5. Um, you can also get the structure from the Italian game. <clears throat> Seems like a, a reasonable position for black. Um, Magnus plays c5. Magnus does play these positions very well. Uh, and Wesley decides to take. It would also be possible to play d5. I guess Wesley was not that happy with the position given that the bishop is on b6 here. Um, but I think this might be uh, this might be you know totally playable for White as well. <clears throat> he plays d e d e queen c1, which introduces the threat of bishop takes h6, or at least the idea of bishop takes h6. Uh, but Magnus responds calmly: c4, knight f5, rook e6. So rook e6. The idea is to allow the queen to come to f8 because now bishop takes h6 was a threat. Um, this allows the, the queen to come to f8 if the queen lands on h6. Um, and here, Wesley trades these bishops, which makes sense because that bishop on b6 really is very strong. Uh, and I think the position here is balanced. The move rook e8, honestly, I didn't completely understand this move. I think in some... Um, in some variations, you know that the the the, uh, the rook might attack the support the attack of the e4 pawn, um, but frankly, I thought you know I thought other moves were possible, and so I don't you know king h7 for example seems like a useful one in a lot of cases. Magnus plays knight f4 and wants to play g6, and it could be helpful to have it there. Um, the one thing I could think of is I guess in some positions with knight f4, the knight takes on e5. And maybe having an extra attacker on the e4 pawn matters. So maybe that's he thought it was a useful move. Of course, a little, but it's a little mysterious. Um, Wesley plays rook d2, one that's easier to explain. In some cases, he'll play rook d1, try to control that open file. Knight f4, king h2, with the idea of playing g3 in a lot of cases. Um, and now Magnus goes back to rook d8. Um, and I don't know if this was sort of a devilish trap by Magnus. I, maybe it was uh, because this almost, well, this looks like it blunders a pawn and it does lose, you know, a pawn technically. Um, and Wesley can't resist uh, taking it. So he plays rook takes d8, queen takes d8, knight takes e5 um, with the idea that this, you know, knight on f4 is, uh, is hanging. Um, and I'm assuming that, that uh, Wesley underestimated black's counterplay here uh magnus plays knight takes g2 which was his plan taking if you take here queen f4 then that's really uh, less than nothing for the pawn this is a very beautiful position for white plus up a pawn but knight takes g2 leads things to pretty murky uh murky waters and now wesley makes the most natural move queen g3 uh because it looks like you know you don't really want to pin yourself with that pawn However, it turns out that this move was the correct way to play it. After f3, black is compensation, but maybe maybe not more than compensation. Uh, and you can actually play, I think, even more precise to play rook d1 first, uh, threatening the queen, and then on, say, queen e8 or queen c8. Uh, queen c8 maybe is the best move, threatening queen takes f5, f3. Uh, no, not f3 here, sorry. Here we play, no, queen c8, we play knight d6. In some cases, you play f3, and in some cases, you play knight d6. Um, so, but this was preferable. And we'll see what's wrong with the move that, that uh, Wesley played. Queen g3, so natural, attacks g7, introduces these ideas like knight takes h6, defends the knight on e5. So really a very natural move. Unfortunately for Wesley, after knight h5, which is basically the only move for black, queen g2, rook takes e5. Even though black, white can take this pawn on h6, which he does, after king f8, suddenly the black pieces, black's pieces are very harmonious. The white king is, is uncomfortable, and this pawn structure is quite bad. And so, uh, in reality, you know, black is happy to be down a pawn here. Um, the rest of the game was not entirely cleared, not like it was uh, just winning for black the entire way, but it was definitely much easier for black to play. And... Um, Magnus here managed to convert to a better ending, uh, but Wesley almost held it, even though he lost a pawn here. Um, the 
H pawn. He really came very, very close to holding this. And I did want to show several moves later here. Um, yeah, so this is almost the end. Actually, after the move um, G4, uh, White was still able to hold here. He could have made a, this is hard to find in a, in a you know, time pressure situation, but he could play uh, the move Rook C8. And the main idea is that if White, if Black tries to bring the King up, then they don't have access to this to this h4 square because of the knight fork um and so it's it's surprisingly difficult for black to make progress if you play king rook e4 for example um then simply king f2 um and on g3 we just play king f3 and we're attacking the rook and this pawn is eventually going to fall um so yeah i mean it's 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 there's very little that that white can uh that black can do if g3 then you can play knight takes c4 rook takes c4 rook to g8 and again you hold uh, by taking the pawn so uh, it looks like wesley had still a chance to hold instead he played rook h4 and now unfortunately after king g5 rook h7 rook f3 now this is almost study like he can't uh he can't hold here the problem is and this is a beautiful variation actually is that after rook g7 uh, king f4 uh, and king f6 actually king f6 might be a simpler way here king f6 is the simpler way to win actually uh, and yeah but white doesn't have a way to hold both uh, here um, yeah so that's that's actually fairly simple um, and on king d2 rook f2 king d1 g3 now the pawn is too strong uh, just coming to coming to g2 or king f4 and uh, uh, white doesn't have a doesn't have a good way to stop to stop it here so um, unfortunate loss for Wesley it was very close and I think like that the strength of that pawn sacrifice was was surprising maybe even a little bit lucky for Magnus that it was that great um, this is not to say Magnus was lucky to win this game by any means but sometimes you know just a position position end up, ends up being even better than you would have thought and this was certainly a, a case like that um, next game Magnus with the white pieces uh, wasn't overly ambitious uh, and played a line that's uh, very safe for both uh, there, there's been a lot of games between very strong players uh, Caruana has played this for black um, and the pieces get traded and I, th I think this has already all been played before and White has tried a few different plans to try to say I have a tiny tiny edge uh, but Wesley very well prepared uh, neutralized neutralized the position here and Magnus decided not to not to try too hard and uh, was content with a draw um, so this leaves this leaves Wesley with one uh, more chance with the white pieces and he decided to go for something totally different. Uh, he went into the Catalan. Magnus plays this line with a5, which he's played, which he's played a little bit. Also, Anish Giri, I think, has played this line recently. Um, and Wesley plays a move here that is not too common: knight to a3. Uh, and I don't know if he was prepared here and uh, and decided to try this move, or if was if it was inspiration. Certainly a, a normal move in a lot of these Catalan positions, but here it hasn't been played too much, and maybe the the reason why is that it's not it's not that. It, concretely it doesn't seem to lead to any kind of advantage for for white um and magnus plays the most testing way here he takes and plays b5 so he's trying to hang on to the pawn the problem for white is that um if they play a4 b4 they might win this pawn back um by playing for example knight e5 the rook moves somewhere and knight takes c4 um but uh but their d pawn is hanging and so and other ways to try to get it back like if you play for example queen c2 black has time right to to, to start protecting it and on a4 now uh, they can play bishop e4 and then c6 so it's not incredibly easy for white you know you can play maybe queen c1 and i think this has been played before but again you know black plays bishop b7 um a4 b4 and even if you win this pawn back um, well, the, the, the doubled A pawns are not really a sight to, to behold. So, so I think black is probably comfortable here uh, because of these doubled A pawns. You know, black has a plan like maybe knight d7, knight b6. Uh, maybe start with bishop d5 and knight d7, knight b6. It, it feels like black is doing quite quite well here. 
uh, because of these pawns. So Wesley tries queen b1, c6, and e4. So that's an enterprising way to play. Uh, Magnus plays h6, and now again, Wesley finds a very creative idea, plays g4, and this is pretty deep. Um, the idea is that after black has played h6, um, if he takes on g4 here, after e5, the knight doesn't have any squares really. So h3 is a big threat. And, you know, playing h5 is just, you know, pretty ugly. It's possible. It's not necessarily losing for, for black. But I do think that this is, you know, uh, going to be a nice position. For example, bishop g5 and then taking that knight. Um, so, so a very inspired move, I thought, g4. Um, and Magnus plays knight h7, h4. And I think h4 was a mistake. Uh, it's possible that, you know, he could have tried, I don't know if he could try something like e5 here. Um, because um, he must have missed that after h4, Magnus played a very, very strong move, e5, sort of a counter sacrifice. And that's why I'm, I'm wondering whether the move e5 would have made some sense. Um, it still seems like, you know, black black is going to be able to get their pieces out, knight d7, bishop b7, prepare c5. And I don't know if white really has enough here to justify uh, to justify this. But, you know, to me, it, it seems like at least it's uh, it's playable. Maybe you start with like queen e4, bishop b7, h4, or something like that, and just try to attack. Um, I don't know if it's going to work, but it still seems playable. In the game after h4, e5, suddenly black has a really good position. Um, the white king side is a little bit overextended. Uh, he plays knight takes e5, very understandable. I think, you know, pawn takes, bishop takes g4 is not going to be a fun position. The, the white king side is just a little too weak. And these pawns are still are still strong, right? I mean, it's not uh, it's not easy to play against that. Eventually in the end game, they could be really strong. So he plays knight e5, queen takes d4, bishop f4. And... Uh, the computer gives this as very good for black, but it's not, as a human, it still felt like it was kind of scary to me uh, for black. And uh, queen c1 was a nice little move here um, <clears throat> with the idea of rook d1. Uh, the position continues to be messy. And even though the, like, the computer sort of gave an advantage to Magnus all the way through here, uh, it certainly did not feel safe. And in fact, you know, a few moves later, it, we could look in, in great depth at these complications, but it's really sort of a, it's, it's a messy position and a tough one, tough one to explain with like gener general uh, principles. It's all about hanging pieces on, on both sides of the board. Um, but to give you an idea, even though, you know, looking at it from a distance, it looked like Magnus was in control. Um, as, as late as here, White's position was still, uh, still sort of, uh, viable um and in fact in this position after 98 um was wesley's sort of last chance and in the computer gives king h1 as much better for white <laughs> so it's a uh, it's hard to uh i wish i could give more explanations the problem is that this is a game where you know we'd have to spend an hour or two just to try to understand what was going on the last few moves uh but it looks like after rook d8 uh, Magnus might have done better by playing queen f5, giving the king a square, even though this looks very scary, um, instead of playing knight e8, because now after king h1, the idea of king h1 is that the knight actually is not going anywhere. We can sort of take it uh, on the next move, or we can play rook b8 and take it. But the threats to the king are strong. And um, so here, for example, if we play queen h5, which looks very logical and very human move, Rook takes e8, uh, queen h4, king g1. Now, if you play, you can't play rook g6 because of checkmate. So we take, take, and if you compare this to the game after knight f3, now black, is, white is able to run away with king f1. And uh, amazingly, this position actually works out to be okay. It's still still a mess, and you know we can look at all sorts of things here. I looked at queen h2. Just because I'm a curious, I'm a curious cat. I like to figure out what's going on, but it's still a, a very messy position. Tough one to figure out. Queen e4, f5. I mean, very messy. But here, after rook takes e8, the game does end uh, sort of beautifully for Magnus. After queen takes e8, knight f3, check. Um, now, I guess you know, bishop takes f3 would have been uh, 
the technically uh, best way to play, but after bishop d7 and taking the queen, uh, of course, black black is winning. Uh, but after king h1, it's more or less force mate after queen d3, threatening queen d1. Uh, we can't take an f3 because of queen f1. Uh, this is sort of a, a standard standard schema here. Queen g2. Um, and after, but after queen d3, uh, the threat of queen d1 is just too strong. Bishop d2, queen takes d2, uh, and he resigned here because there's no there's no defense really to uh, to these mating threats. So you know, again, a, a, a messy game, uh, sort of unfortunate for Wesley. The the opening didn't work out that well for him, um, and uh, so Magnus got the the better of him in this uh, in this match. But uh, maybe surprising was surprisingly smooth, you could say, from Magnus's perspective, in that he really was not that much in trouble. So we're gonna go back here to our our uh, bracket. Um, as you can see, a reminder: you know, Magnus and Hikaru are going to play in the next match. Um, in you know what is gonna be a a, a very uh, very hotly expected match. Uh, they had a really tough final in the uh, pr previous event of the Magnus Tour, and so it'll be interesting to see how they do in the in this uh, in this event. Um, and then on the other side tomorrow, we have uh, the, the quarterfinal action continuing with Yu Yangyi, Ding Li Ren, Daniel Dubov, and Sega Karyakin battling it in the third match to decide who gets to play in the second semifinal. And um, yeah, so join us again tomorrow for all of the action. Uh, and yeah, a couple more things. Follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter is always a great source of information, even for me as I prepare these after shows. I always go through our Twitter and find some some cool moments from our from our broadcast commentary, uh, funny moments of the day, sometimes interviews with Magnus. So follow us on tw Twitter, chess twenty at chess twenty four uh, com c o m, uh, and do participate also in our fantasy chess contest. Uh, they are posted for every round. And finally, uh, there's also the Lindors Abbey. Uh, quiz which happens every few days take a look at that we have some amazing prizes for that some very expensive uh, chess sets more expensive chess sets than I've ever than I have ever owned for sure um, so yeah someone said uh, what opening do you recommend for a draw against e4 we'll cover that uh, we'll cover that as a uh, as a last as a last uh, question of the day um, I mean, it's hard to say. The thing is, you know, e4, e5 is, is certainly the most solid opening. Uh, opening, But, you know, you could argue that the Zvezhnikov Sicilian, for example, if you know it very well, is actually a very, very solid weapon for black. And then, you know, um, in e4, e5, sure, it's it's solid, but all of these Rilo Lopez positions are not necessarily uh, trivial. And, and I think these Berlin lines that white is playing with d3 and bishop takes e6, are really not that drawish. Uh, you know, Hikaru was in some trouble probably against uh, Aronian yesterday in a must-win situation for Aronian. Um, but surely, you know, e4, e5 is sort of the standard the standard answer. Uh, and then playing probably the Marshall Gambit, you know, with black if you know it well again. Or even the Petrov is a, is a reasonable choice. Uh, the Berlin also. So all these e4, e5 sort of staples are, are probably the, uh, the choice. So... I agree with Fuxia there. Um, so, all right, thanks everybody for uh, thanks everybody for joining me for this for this after show again, and I will see you all tomorrow. Uh, have a great night.